The question I want us to look at this morning is, what do I do if I am sinking? And when I thought of that phrase, I couldn't help but think of this old commercial that I think is maybe 15 years old. Have anybody ever seen this commercial? It's by Berlitz Language School. And uh, I thought about showing it, but I'll just kind of say what happened. You can look it up later if you want to. But um, so yeah, it's by a language called per Berlitz. And the beginning of the commercial shows this young German Coast Guard um, soldier, whatever you call him, being trained. This is him being trained to sit in this radio room and watch the radar. And he's given very, very brief instructions. Um, and then his instructor leaves the room. And as soon as his instructor leaves the room, suddenly over the radio comes an English, uh, British accent saying, Mayday, Mayday, we're sinking, we're sinking. And this, this, uh, this young Coast Guard guy gets kind of nervous and he he taps on the microphone, and again, he hears that, Mayday, we're sinking, we're sinking. And then this guy says, hello, this is the German Coast Guard. What are you sinking about? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and here's the thing, you know, if you are sinking, whether it's actual or metaphorical, the last thing you want to happen is that somebody misunderstand you, right? You want to be understood in that moment. And the reason I bring this up is because today we're looking at, I think, one of the more famous stories in the Gospels. It's when Peter walks on water. We're going to be in Matthew 14. And you know, even that phrase, um, walking on water, has become a metaphor, hasn't it? What, what, what's it a metaphor of? If, you, if somebody says, that guy's walking on water, what does it imply? Say it again. Doing something risky, yeah, I, I can see that, yeah. Impossible, yeah. Everything is going smoothly, yeah, I think that too. It's like things are going great, right? And, and we know that this was an actual story. I'm not saying that Peter walking on water was a metaphor. Don't, don't take that away. Um, but it has become metaphorical for things are going great, all right? And within moments, Peter was sinking. And yes, he actually sank. But it's also become metaphor for what? If you're sinking, if you're drowning, what does that mean? You're in serious trouble. That's right. Something has happened, and you just feel like you're overwhelmed. Um, you feel anxiety. You feel stress. Um, things aren't going well. You feel like you're sinking. So the question again is, what do I do if I am sinking? And when we're sinking, what do we need? We need, we need a life ring, all right? And so as we look at today's story, um, I can identify five different life rings that I think we need to take hold of today. And maybe you'll see some other life rings in there that you'll grab a hold of today, and that's great. But let's go ahead and read this story. This is Matthew chapter 14. This is uh, verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touched the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. 
So Jesus, we thank you for this story, this, this real event that we believe happened in real time, real history. But we can look at it and we can also see a metaphor for times in our life where we feel overwhelmed, where we feel like circumstances are just more than we can bear. Um, we feel like we are sinking too. So we pray, God, that as, as we look at this story and just see some truths about you, truths about ourselves, just your goodness, Lord, that we would grab a hold of these life rings today, that no matter where we're at, whether we're on a high, a mountaintop today, or whether we feel like we're grasping, grasping to stay above the water, Lord, I pray that you would um, use your word to encourage and, and build our faith in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first life ring I want to look at is this. Don't assume a mistake. Don't assume that, that there's been a mistake, that you have made a mistake, that there's a mistake that has happened. All right, when we, when we look at the story, it's, it's easy to think, boy, that seems like a mistake. Because when you think about the conditions of them going on this boat trip, first of all, it's dark. It's, it's happening toward the evening. Because the previous story, the disciples said, Master, it's already getting late. Let's provide some food, right? Jesus says, no, you're going to feed them. And so it's already after what we think is maybe 10,000 people have eaten. And so it's, it's, it's pretty late. So it's dark. It's windy. Jesus is specifically not getting in the boat with them. And they've just eaten. And when I was a kid, you were supposed to stay out of the water, you know, for at least a half hour <laughs> after you've eaten. All right. And so it seems like kind of a setup. Seems a bit like a setup. But here's the question. Who is actually setting it up? Jesus. Jesus is setting up the story. Let's look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made. And there's a Greek word there called anankadzo. Okay? Translates made here in the IV. He made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Now that anankadzo, I didn't, I didn't know this until this past week, is a really, really strong Greek word. In fact, it's only used, Jesus, it's only used one time in the Gospels to describe something that Jesus is doing, acting upon somebody else. This one time. It, it, and the, the word anankadzo, it communicates this idea that you are inescapably compelled to do something inescapably compelled to do something. In fact, Paul uses that same word um, in, the, in the book of 1 Corinthians 9.16. It says, for when I preach the gospel, Paul says, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled. Now it's translated compelled, right? The same, it was made before, now it's compelled. I am compelled, I am anankadzo. It's almost like he's saying, I am forced. I don't have a choice in this. I'm compelled to preach, woe to me, if I do not preach the gospel. Now, here's, here's the thing. I believe in free will, and I'm sure many of you do. It means I, I have a free will to make my choice, and I believe God gives us choices most of the time. <laughs> it's like somebody, if somebody asks me, are you a Calvinist or an Arminian? I like to say it just depends on what verse I'm reading, right? It depends on, it depends on what story I'm looking at. <laughs> Most of the time, but I believe that there are times when God overrides our free will and he compels us to do something. He compels us where it seems inescapable. You look at the story of Paul. What's his story? He was, he was, he was knocked to his feet. He was blinded for three days, <laughs> right? Brought to the house of Ananias. It's almost like he wasn't in control of his own destiny, right? And so there's this, 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 this is what Jesus does. He compels them to get into the boat under really bad conditions. It's dark, it's stormy, they've just eaten, and he's not going in the boat with them, <laughs> right? He's compelling them to do this. And I remember, you know, there's times in our life where we are just compelled, right? I remember, um, I remember taking Noah to kindergarten, the very first day of a kindergarten, <laughs> back in whatever year that was when he turned uh, the age of kindergarten. And I remember it was so difficult. There were tears, my tears, okay? 
Uh, there was complaining. That was me too, right? I, you know, just we we weren't ready. Noah, you know, it was it was tough for Noah too. It was it was a new place, but there was something about it, and you know this as a parent, where it's almost like you don't have a choice. This is what we do, right? This is your time to go to school. This is my time to let you go, as a parent. So it it, it just had to be done. And there's times like this in life where we have responsibilities. And our love, what does it do? It compels us. Our love actually compels us to act upon those that we love. And God's love actually compels us at times to do the difficult thing. And so in this story, you know, the disciples are not choosing to take off in a storm at night after dinner without Jesus in the boat. That's not their choice. Jesus is choosing this for them, anankadzo. He is compelling them. He is making them get in the boat. He doesn't tie them up, no, right? He doesn't tie them up, but something about the authority of Jesus compels them. And as followers of Jesus, he does this. As followers of Jesus, we can't say no. And so when we feel like we're sinking, we're tempted to think in that moment, when we're sinking, when we're frustrated, when we're stressed out, when we're worried, when we're hurt, we're tempted to think in that moment, I made a big mistake. I shouldn't have made that move. I shouldn't have changed jobs. I shouldn't have done X, Y, Z. But I want to encourage you this morning to trace it back to the very beginning. Were you following the call of God? Were you saying yes to Jesus? Were you pursuing that decision in prayer? Did you feel like God led you into this moment? And if the answer to that is no, well, just repent, right? God's mercy and his grace brings forgiveness. But if yes, trust Jesus that he knows what he's doing. Because the disciples in that moment could have thought, man, we shouldn't have gotten the boat. That was stupid. Well, wait a minute. No, Jesus compelled us to get in the boat. He called us to be in this situation. Because Jesus knew the disciples were going to face at least two things. They were going to face the external circumstances, the wind, the waves. And he knew they were going to face internal fears. But Jesus was setting them up for at least a couple things. He was setting them up to walk on water. That's pretty cool, right? And he was setting them up to reach out for his hand when they felt they were sinking. And so just because things are going bad, don't assume there's a mistake. Don't assume there's a mistake. Look back. Is Jesus involved? Yes, he is. All right. He's setting me up for something. All right. I guess I had some more thoughts on this. <laughs> I thought I was going to the next point. <laughs> no, I'm not. I got a few points more on this. Um, <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I did. Never mind. Where am I at? I'm lost. Okay, here we are. Second thing. Remember, remember that Jesus is praying. That's the, number, the second thing. Remember that Jesus is praying. Matthew 14, 23, it says, After he had dismissed the crowd, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. All right, what is Jesus praying about? What do you think? Jesus has gone up on a mountainside to pray. Here's the context in case you forgot. So we just came and at the top of chapter 14, we learned that John the Baptist has been put to death. He's been beheaded. Uh, Jesus was close friends and cousin. So he was mourning. And it says in the, earlier in chapter 14 that he actually went away by himself. But the crowds found him, they followed him, and so he wasn't able to get that alone time. So yes, part of it seems like he's grabbing that alone time, finally, at the end of the whole day of ministry. But, but what is Jesus praying about? What do you think? It's, mere, it's pure speculation, I know. But what do you think Jesus is praying about? Well, think on that for a bit, okay? <laughs> Is it too much to speculate that Jesus might have been praying for the guys on the boat? Because mm. Jesus prays several times throughout the Gospels, and we're not always told what he's praying for, but the few times that Scripture tells us what Jesus is praying for, there seems to be a pattern. Let me put it this way. Let's read these verses where, where it tells us exactly what he was praying for. Luke 22, verse 31 to 32 says, Simon, Simon, Jesus is talking, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, 
but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So who was Jesus praying for? Simon. Praying for Simon, right? John 17, 20. This is a famous passage, Jesus' um, Jesus prayer. It's called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them might be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, that the whole world may believe that you have sent me. Who is Jesus praying for? Believers, followers, the church, disciples. That's right. Hebrews 7, 24 to 25, it says, But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Who is Jesus praying for here? Yeah, who is he interceding for? All those that would come to believe in him. Yep. Uh, yeah, he lives, he lives. So who is Jesus praying? He's, praying? he's praying for people. He's praying for us. And so is it too much to think that Jesus might have been praying for the trial that he knew that he allowed his disciples to move into? Guys, get in the boat. It's dark, Jesus. I know. Get in the boat. It's stormy, Jesus. I know. Get in the boat. Aren't you going with us, Jesus? Not right now. Get in the boat. <laughs> okay. Right? And then Jesus goes up on a mountainside and begins to pray. I'd like to believe that Jesus was praying and interceding, just like scripture says he does, for his disciples. And so this is the second life ring, the knowledge that Jesus is praying for you. And just, just to clarify, does God hear Jesus pray? Do you think? <laughs> yeah, kind of a mind-blowing thought, right? Because he is God, so I don't know how that all works. Uh, does Jesus pray in line with God's will? Yeah, of course. And so this is good news. Jesus is praying. He's praying for you. He's praying for you while you are sinking, while you are worried, while you are thinking, I've made a mistake, he's praying. Okay, number three, third life ring is recognize God's presence. Recognize his presence. Now, we already have established that he wasn't in the boat. He's on a mountainside. They're in the boat. But it doesn't mean that he wasn't there. Okay? Okay. Because in the Gospels, Jesus saw things that he wasn't there to see. Can you think of a story? When did that happen? He saw something, but he wasn't there to see it. Woman at the well. Woman at the well. Okay. When he called, when he called Philip, Nathaniel, or yeah, that, that, that's right. I think he's. I can't. I, I'm getting switched around too. But yeah, he saw Nathaniel. I think at, underneath a tree before he even called him. So Jesus, yeah, he saw things. It's like. Wow, it's almost like he had an omnipresence sort of thing about him, right? And that's what we say about God. He's omnipresent. And so Jesus, he wasn't there, but, he, but, he's, but he's there. Matthew, in Matthew 14, verse 27, listen to what he says. This is in the story. He says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Now, when Jesus says, it is I, the Greek phrase is ego I me. Am I saying that right, Christian? Ego I me. How many know what that Greek phrase means? Anybody here ever hear that phrase before? Ego, I mean. So it can be translated into English, it is I. But when it comes to John, it's actually translated I am. OK? John 8.58 says, very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. It's the same exact Greek words. And so we could actually go back to Matthew and say, Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, I am. I am. And what is, what is the significance of I am? That was the name that he told him to call Moses. That was the, yeah, the name he gave to Moses. It's the name that God gave Moses. That's right. Jesus, when we read the passage in John, that's like a subtle in our ears, but in then it, back then it wasn't that subtle that he was literally declaring himself to be God. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay? This is Jesus saying, I'm God. And so I hear Jesus saying the same thing when he's walking on the water to the disciples who were under distress, and he says, take courage, guys. I am. I'm God. He exists through all of time. 
That's right. In fact, let's go to Exodus 3.13. It says, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are saying to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so is it, you know, it's not a coincidence when Jesus says, take courage, I am. I am. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. No matter where you're at, even as you're sinking, even as you're in distress, I am. I'm right there with you. Okay? And it's not the only time Jesus did that. I want to take you to a couple of other passages where Jesus says the same thing. And so if somebody ever says Jesus never declared himself to be God, way off, right? They're wrong. Jesus actually did. Mark 14, verse 61 to 64, it says, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Verse 62, he says, I am. Ego, I me, right? Said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting on the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? In other words, this guy has just called himself God. He asked, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. And Luke 24, again, verse 38, says, He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, or ego I me, I am. Touch me and see a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Okay, so here's what I want you to see. When we're sinking in doubt, when we're sinking in anxiety, when we're sinking in various challenges, God throws us this life ring. He simply says, I am here. I am present. I am. I am. I'm, I'm right here in your midst. You're not alone. So when you're sinking, recognize that immediate presence of the I am. Okay? Fourth life ring is to be discerning about your doubts. Be discerning about your doubts. Verse 30 in chapter 14, it says, But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? So we all have doubts. I know that. We all have doubts. It's not wrong to doubts. In fact, sometimes doubts can save us from a lot of hassle. For instance, uh, when, I go on, when I go on Facebook, usually I'm on Marketplace looking to see what's available. And yeah. you know, they must hear my conversations or they see what my interests are because I've gotten, I've gotten ads for uh, little tiny campers. You know, and some of you know that I've, I've you know, I had a few campers in the past that we rented out. And they'll just be ridiculously cheap, like $1,000 for what should be a $15,000 camper. And uh, I think the first time it got me, but after that, like, no, I doubt that. You know, I doubt that. And then just last week, there was an explosion of um, ads for these double, uh, you know, camp little love seats, because we have one. And I was looking one day for a second one, and there was like half a dozen ads, all for these little camping love seats. Different sellers, but they all had the exact same picture, right? It's like they all owned the same one. <laughs> they all owned, they were all living in the same house because they all took the exact same pictures of the same thing. And it was half the price of anybody else. So again, it's, I doubt that. And I encourage you to doubt that as well. <laughs> okay, doubt those things. But in today's story, Peter is walking on the water toward the great I am. Jesus has just said, take courage, I am, right? Peter is walking toward him. And I can imagine that every single sense is activated. Every sense is activated. He hears the sound of the waves hitting the side of the boat. He feels the water underneath his feet walking on the water. He has the taste in his mouth of a miracle supper. He, he ate bread and ate fish that came from almost nowhere. Jesus multiplied the fish and the loaves. The taste is still in his mouth. He can smell the sound of the, the smell of the sea, and he sees Jesus. And in this entire scene of all his senses, what does Ch Peter choose to doubt? He, he, he doubts, he doubts Jesus' ability to sustain him, right? Everything kind of communicates to his senses, and he doubts Jesus' ability to hold him up. And of all the things to doubt, 
Peter doubts the one thing that need not be doubted. He doubts the one thing that doesn't have to be doubted, which is just the steadfastness of Jesus, the faithfulness of Jesus. And in our world right now, there's so many things for us to doubt. We can doubt, we can doubt that the election will go smoothly. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can doubt that the cost of living is going to go down. Um, we can doubt ourselves, but there's no reason to doubt God's faithfulness. There's no reason to doubt that he can't sustain us. His record is completely flawless, right? In Peter's case, in Peter's case, Peter could have doubted that the water could hold him up because water can't hold you up. He could have doubted that. He could doubt that the wind would, would die down because even though the wind did die down later, it would pick up, pick up again another day. He could, but there was no reason no reason to doubt the ability of God to sustain him and hold him up no matter what. And there's no reason for any of us in the room to doubt the faithfulness of God. Okay? Right. Last fifth ring is just worship. Verse 32, it says, When Jesus and Peter climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Now, I, I, I do understand that they worshipped him after the terror of sinking was gone. <laughs> they worshipped him after they were back in the boat. They worshipped him after the wind died down. But they were also living out the story in real time, right? Let's not judge them too harshly. harshly. <laughs> they didn't know for sure how it was going to end, but we know how it ended. And the story is here to teach us how we can live when it feels like we're sinking in our own real time, okay, while we're right now, while we're in that place of sinking. But there is another man, and I want to read his story in Scripture, who, um, who worshipped even while he was sinking. Anybody know who I'm talking about? There's, nope, Old Testament story. He sank to the depths, in fact, and that's when he worshipped. Jonah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Jonah. So sometimes we, uh, we forget that he actually, he worshiped. And I want to read his story. It's just 10 verses in chapter 2. I'm just, it's all of chapter 2 of Jonah. It's, it's the last verse of uh, chapter 1 and then all of chapter 2. But let me just read that. It says, uh, now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God and said, and I like the way he, he words it almost like it's, it's almost past tense, but the Bible says it's from the belly. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I cried for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths in the very heart of the seas and the currents swirled about me. Again, it's that idea of like God brought me into this place. Peter was what? Anankadzo. They were, they were made to get into the boat. Jonah says, you hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head to the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever, but you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So Jonah worshipped in the midst. The disciples worshipped on the boat. But the bottom line is worship is a life ring. Okay, It's a life ring for us. In the midst of the trials... We say, Lord, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to praise you. Even while it feels like I'm sinking. Okay? Even while it feels like I'm sinking. 
And I just want to throw this in here. If, 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 if you're one who has never, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing at Bertie. Um, <laughs> sorry, you, you can tell us why later. Um, I figured it out, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> um, seems like a baby might have had an accident, that's all. Um, actually, I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and summarize here. What do I do if I'm sinking? What do I do if I'm sinking? Number one, don't assume a mistake. Don't assume a mistake. Assuming a mistake is based on this theology that nothing will ever go wrong to me as a follower of Jesus. But the fact is, we go through difficult times. And difficulties do not mean that you have gone off the rails, you're off the trail. It could be that God has actually called you into this place. He's refining you. He's purifying you. So don't just assume a mistake could be that God has actually led you into this place. Number two, remember that Jesus is praying, right? Every instance where, where it, the Bible says what Jesus is praying for, he's praying for people. He's praying for us. He's interceding for us. Number three, recognize God's presence. I am, Jesus says, take courage. Take courage. He doesn't say it was me. It will be me. He says it is I. I am. I'm present. I always have been. I'm right here. Number four, be, be discerning about your doubts. Lots of things you can doubt. Don't doubt Jesus. He's faithful, okay? And number five, worship. Find a way throughout the week just to worship. Worship in the midst of the pain. Worship in the midst of the confusion, okay? If you need to, put on a, put on a Spotify list and just enter into a place of praise, okay? So I'm going to close with a word of prayer. And uh, at the end of that, um, we're going to do something different today. I asked Christian if he would help me with this. Um, Christian and I are just going to be up front here. He'll be over here. I'll be over here. And if you just want somebody, if you want one of us to pray with you, we have anointing oil. And um, if something about today's message just connected and you say, I want, I want prayer for that, um, we're going to be up here for you. And, uh, and if you don't come up here, that's fine. If you want to ask somebody else in here to pray, totally can do that too. So let's dismiss the word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for this story that Peter, he, he walked on water, amazing, and the whole world remembers this. Many people who don't, aren't even followers of Jesus know the story of Peter walking on water. And then the whole world knows the, also the story of Peter sinking. And so we too, we, we have times when things are just going great, but there's other times where it feels like we're sinking. And, and maybe some in this room are sinking. They have that feeling today. And I pray, Jesus, that they would reach out to you, not doubt you, maybe doubt anything else in life, doubt their finances, doubt relationship, whatever. But Lord, they're not going to doubt you. I pray that they would grab onto you with both hands and all their faith today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.